lovely introduction and thank you for, for coming out this evening. Um, I work at the Vermont Historical Society. What I'm going to talk to you about this evening is sort of our initial um, conclusions, initial thoughts, uh, and findings as part of a project that we've Take. We've done over the last couple of years, um, serving the entire state of Vermont to try and um, collect, document, and share what went on specifically within the counterculture in Vermont in the 1970s. I have a touch of a cold, so I will try to speak up and enunciate, but I apologize um, if I have to clear my throat or anything like that. Um, so. Before I start, the Vermont Historical Society is the statewide historical society. We are an independent nonprofit. We have a museum in Montpelier next to the State House and a research center in Barrie where we house collections, both object collections and archival collections, papers, books, um, and so on. Um, we produce exhibits, we uh, ha have educational programs, we have statewide programming, um, and we are sort of like uh, Vermont's repository. We like to say that we're connecting Vermonters to their story, um, that our goal is to, is to be transparent about the way that history has influenced your lives. Um, so which is a great way for me to launch in. Um, to talking about the 1970s, as you may be guessing, I was not around during the 1970s, so for some of you this will be a much more personal and lived history um, than it is for me. I'm coming at this uh, more from the perspective of having worked on the project uh, for the last couple of years, so I have a bit of an outsider perspective. The project was actually directed by uh, our recently retired curator, Jackie Calder, who was curator of the Vermont Historical Society for many years and was a graduate student at UVM during the 1970s. So between the two of us, we sort of met in the middle with our two different perspectives. Um, but I should give credit to Jackie as the, uh, the original driver behind this project, um, who wanted to do this project and um, was the lead on it. So let me start off by what a lot of people think of <laughs> when they think of counterculture in the 1970s and in Vermont. This is a photograph of students who lived on Goddard College's Northwood campus. It was published in the 1971 Goddard College yearbook. And this sort of sums up a lot of stereotypes. I always get a little bit of a laugh when I share it. Um, and this actually is the lead off uh, photograph, that one of the first things you see when you enter our exhibit um, that is now up in, in Barrie about the 1970s. Um, this photograph is both sort of typical but also misleading. And that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about tonight, um, about what counterculture, what we mean by counterculture, what was actually going on here in Vermont, how that shaped the state going forward. Before I do that, I want to talk to you a little bit about some sort of dry history stuff that sets the stage and gives some context um, of what Vermont, a couple of long-term trends of Vermont history in the 20th century. The first one I want to talk about is changes in land use across the state of Vermont. Uh, dairy farms statistically had been starting to fade from the Vermont agricultural landscapes, actually starting some years before. Um, you start to see a very small statistical downward slope um, in the 1920s, and that starts to speed up uh, in the 1950s with the introduction of the bulk tank, um, which was an expensive technology that not a lot of small farmers wanted to or were able to uh, adapt. Um, the next shift is that a lot of similar, sort of on a similar track to that dairy farm, but also larger, um, also in grain farms and other types of farming, small farms are starting to fade from the Vermont landscape as well. Um, you, it's entering an economic phase where you have to become a bigger farm um, milk far more cows, harvest far more fields, just do a lot more to make yourself break even, or you shift to a different business model. So we're starting to see the consolidation. Farms are getting bigger and bigger, the farms that remain. Um, and the, la the last is that statistically from about, like I said, about the 1920s onward, we do see a, a slow but steady and noticeably, statistically noticeable decline in land under cultivation in Vermont. Um, so overall, that adds up to uh, changes in land use across the Vermont landscape. We tend to think of ourselves as a, as a deeply agricultural state, and we definitely are. Um, but I don't want, what I want to set the context for you is I don't want you to think that um, things just happened along and Vermont was a bucolic, straightforward, rural, small state until 1969, and then it hit a wall. 
Um, so what I'm trying to say is there are some long-term trends that are humming along in the background. They're going to start to catalyze um, in the 60s and the 70s. So the second of our, our big long-term trends throughout Vermont in the 20th century is political changes. Um, the growth of the urban areas, in particular Chittenden County, small towns getting smaller, big towns getting bigger, uh, a handful of, of more cities incorporating, um, and this is a trend that's happening again throughout the 20th century. We're going to talk in just a minute about population changes within the state of Vermont. The thing to remember about um, when I talk about that is the vast majority of population growth in the 1960s and 70s took place in Chittenden County, um, something like 60 to 75 percent, depending on what year you look at were all people going to Chittenden County. Um, so there is a consolidation of people in cities. Um, there are also broad party shifts going on. Uh, a lot of people may know that Vermont was one of the most reliably, dependably Republican states from 1860 to about 1960. Um, it had always held down the progressive wing of the Republican Party. It was sort of harkening back to a previous party system. But with the shifts in the American party system of the 1960s, and with one major um, Supreme Court decision on something called reapportionment, that's going to start to change in Vermont uh, in the 1950s, and it's going to speed up through the 1960s. Reapportionment was a Supreme Court decision that required Vermont to redraw its representational, its um, congressional districts um, such that they represented equal amounts of population as opposed to one town. Vermont had a system until the 1960s where each representative represented one town. Um, the typical example given of that is a standard Vermont population, about 150 people, had the exact same number of votes in the state legislature as Burlington, Vermont. And there was a Supreme Court decision handed down that said that's unconstitutional, that's not fair representation. So the districts were redrawn, um, the number of seats was uh, dropped at the same time. What that did was that, again, as we said, growth of urban areas, it swung uh, political weight towards more populated areas. Um, this was a deeply controversial and deeply emotional moment um, in Vermont's history, but the end result was that um, there was a pretty steep and sudden rise in the number of Democratic representatives and seats uh, in the Vermont state legislature and then statewide. Uh, and last but not least, the change in the voting age. Um, between 1970 and 1972, the national voting age was dropped to age 18, and that was dropped in Vermont as well. That's going to cause one very specific result in Vermont that we'll talk about in a minute. But generally, it also encouraged more political activism on young, young people, particularly people in college and university. And it resulted in um, the youngest representative legislative, excuse me, legislative class in the Vermont State Legislature in its history in 1972. Two freshman legislators that year were Madeline Cunin and Jim Douglas. Um, among, among others, they were actually, there was a whole picture of the sort of young Turks coming in uh, that year. Jim Douglas, of course, right out of college, um, so very young. Madeline Cunin, a bit, a bit older, but it opened up uh, a sort of a more diverse legislature and a younger legislature. So that plays an impact on Vermont's political um, story, but again, it's something that's been going on through the 20th century. And the last is, is opening the borders of Vermont and creating uh, a flow of people to and from the state. The interstate, Eisenhower Interstate Highway System came to Vermont starting in the late 1940s with the construction of 89, 91, the spur of 93, and that little spur of 189. Um, throughout the state. That's going to start in the late 1940s. It's going to continue until the early 1980s. It took forever to build them. They were opening up like a two-mile section every year, basically. Um, but that means, logically, that more people can get to Vermont, they can get to Vermont faster, and they can get to Vermont for shorter concentrated periods of time, which uh, leads me into tourism growth, um, which again, long-term 20th century trend had actually started with Vermont farmers opening up their farms to city folks in the 1880s, um, had sped up a little bit in the 1920s, and is going to hit a huge uh, curve upwards after World War II, um, which is post-war economic growth. This is a national trend that's going to affect Vermont as well. More large companies start coming to Vermont, in particular IBM up near Burlington, but there are other examples as well, and the tourism industry is going to start to become much more of a big dollar industry, um, so people coming to Vermont. At the same time, um, national migration trends are going to mean that people are also leaving Vermont. 
um, to pursue economic opportunities elsewhere in Boston, New York, um, or elsewhere. So the population flow is going to accelerate quite a lot. So that's your really fast trip through some big trends of 20th century history before we get to the 19th change in Vermont from 1960 to 1980. Population 389,881, of whom 72% are native born in the year 1960. Ten years later, there's a 14% population increase. Of that population increase, 66% um, were native born. So a little more than half of the people coming to Vermont or being born in Vermont from 1960 to 1970 are native born. And then, and then from 1970 to 1980, you get a 15% population increase um, of about 57% of people from out of state. Those are the biggest population growth changes in Vermont's history basically since the Revolutionary War. Vermont's population from about 1810, 1820 onward was either stable or declining ever so slightly, not increasing at the rate of the national population increase. And it's as it is right now. Um, these, these couple of decades are sort of an outlier um, in Vermont's demographic history. Um, one important, as I mentioned, a lot of this population growth is happening in Chittenden County. But I want you to remember 57% of that 15% population growth is from out of state. So it's about 44,000 people. That's a number I'll call back on in just a minute. The majority of those people are not hippies. <laughs> or they're not part of the counterculture. They're people seeking jobs uh, in largely in the Burlington area. IBM is going to be a huge driver um, of population growth, but other large companies uh, as well. And people are also leaving the state um, at the same time to do the same thing in reverse. So keep in mind, 44,000 people total population increase in the entire decade from 1970 to 1980. So with that, the 1970s. When we started this project, what we actually did was a, a three-year project. Year one, uh, we got a, a federal grant to, to run this project. Year one was we went out and about and we said, tell us about counterculture in the 1970s. We held community forums. We did this big survey. We traveled to places all over the state to talk to both individuals and communities and organizations. And we set out this big survey. And we set out this survey with a lot of assumptions. Um, based on sort of prior research that we had done to get this project. We'd been thinking and talking about it for about five years before we even wrote the grant. So we had some ideas of what we wanted to look at. We did the survey, and we thought, here are ways in which people would be involved in the counterculture, right? Food, uh, politics, community organizing, protesting, social reform, environmental and sustainability issues, arts and crafts, music, uh, the phrase just dropping out, which is a contemporary phrase. Um, the answer that surprised us is this bottom one here. I did not consider myself part of the counterculture. This is a survey that was sort of advertised as, would you like to talk about Vermont's counterculture in the 1970s? Right? This is going to people who later in this survey will say, yeah, I lived in a commune for 20 years, and I never ate store-bought bread that entire time, and so on. They still did not consider themselves part of the counterculture. Um, what we learned through this project is that counterculture is a loaded term. People might not always consider that label to apply to themselves. We end up using it because it's sort of become an, an acceptable history term more broadly to refer to that movement. But I want you to keep in mind that not everyone as part of this project considers themselves to be you know, counterculture. Um, either they're trying to develop a new culture, and they don't think they should have to be counter anything. Um, they were not joiners. They didn't want to be part, considered part of this broader movement. Um, or they just had personal, like they didn't want to be associated with that part of the counterculture. They didn't want to be associated with the drugs, maybe. Or they, they would not get near a vegetable patch if you paid them. Or there is, so what I'm saying is there is a huge diversity and variety of ways in which people are involved in the ideas and the trends that I'm about to talk about. And that they did not necessarily consider themselves part of some kind of monolithic movement um, at the time and, and also now. So that's my caveat. Um, the decade of the 70s, some people say the 60s died in May 1970. 
uh, with the shootings at Kent State. And this is really when the 70s arrive in Vermont as well. This is part of a protest at the University of Vermont um, the day after the Kent State shootings in May 1970. Um, this was sort of the big rude awakening. There had been some rumors. Um, people had started to move back to the land in Vermont for a couple of years before this. But this is when it sort of reaches a statewide consciousness that what's happening elsewhere is also going to impact Vermont. Um, UVM, uh, Middlebury College, Goddard College, St. Michael's College, most of the colleges and universities either went on strike for a full week, uh, held teach-ins, held protests. Um, these are not small um, meetings. These are not small gatherings. Uh, anywhere from a couple of days to a full week. Um, even Norwich University, which I think we're used to thinking of as a very conservative place because it is a military school, um, students snuck out and lowered the flag to half-mast um, for the, the victims of the Kent State shootings. This is a matter of deep, deep concern uh, among college presidents and all the way up to the governor, Dean Davis, at the time. He maintained uh, correspondence and phone calls with every president of every college and university in the state. And he also had a great deal of frantic communication with the young district, uh, excuse me, young attorney for Chittenden County, uh, Patrick Leahy, who was about my age at that time. He was 33, um, getting his political start. Uh, and they're, they're really concerned that uh, Kent State is going to be the, the start of a series of protests that will turn violent and that will start um, on campuses and spread throughout the state. There was some concern that they might have to call out the Vermont National Guard um, to help manage protests on campus. And this brings it all home. This makes it all real um, for Vermont for the first time in the 1970s. There's a, there's a fraying um, of what had been a sort of previously accepted way to think and talk uh, about things. Uh, and the fact that the, this has to also to do directly with Vietnam um, is our introduction into the 1970s. Because a lot of that, that fraying and that breaking of the social fabric um, occurs because of the war in Vietnam. Um, people told us over and over again when we talked to them, you, you cannot understand, you cannot imagine how heavily that weighed on everything we thought, everything we did, every interaction we had with each other, with the government, with people in the local community, was impacted um, by Vietnam and by everyone's deep feelings on both sides um, of that issue. So Vietnam is going to be the start um, of, of the 70s in Vermont, and specifically the protests um, against Vietnam. Uh, and it's going to be the start of some, some really sophisticated political organizing here in Vermont. Um, people started to move to Vermont in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, they, some of them lived on communes. Some of them bought their own farms. Some of them moved to apartments in Burlington. Some of them came as students at universities and colleges. But a lot of them had in common um, sort of a shared sense of social justice, of, of protest work. Some of them had participated uh, in really meaningful ways in the civil rights marches and organizing in the South in the 1960s. So they came to Vermont with, with a really sophisticated sense of how to organize people how to send, spread a message, and how to start to use those two things together to build um, for change. So the earliest organizing in Vermont is around protests um, to Vietnam. This is a poster you can see um, Billings. This was on the UVM campus um, of people to organize and get on buses. Um, to go down to Washington, D.C. to protest Vietnam. And we're going to see this pattern repeated over and over again throughout the decade. Um, this is a group of people. This is a year after. This is May 1971. This is a group of people from a, a community um, near Burlington. Uh, one of them is a UVM professor, actually, Will Miller, of the philosophy department. Um, I, I can't even tell. I literally spent like a year and a half looking at this picture before I realized they're in the middle of the street. <laughs> It just looked like people on a park bench. They're blocking a street in Washington, D.C. as part of, uh, part of their protest. Um, and just sort of hanging out. Um, so a lot of this early organizing is coalesces around Vietnam and opposition to the war uh, in, in Vietnam. But that's not the only way it coalesces. See up there, headline up there, hippie communes in six towns. 
Right around this same time, so this is December 1970, shortly after sort of the idea of protest and counterculture and all of those other things starting to happen in Vermont that happened after the Kent State protests, there starts to be this gathering rumor or gathering understanding that people are starting to move to Vermont to either found back to the land communities, as I said, to, to live on their own back to land communities, and people start to get worried. Um, not everyone by any stretch of the imagination, but there's some, something starts to sort of percolate to the top, and it starts to be on everyone's mind that, that people are going to, the hippies are going to come um, move up and you know, change everything, ruin everything, it, it, whole spectrum of responses to it. Uh, this is St. Albans Messenger. This is an article, believe it or not, from Playboy magazine. <laughs> this is a national news article. Um, also, it, so this is the spring of 1971. Here's, here's what happened over that winter that really sets this into high gear. Um, there was a Yale uh, law paper, not the Yale Law Review, but a secondary journal in which a couple of students who were just having a thought experiment said, I bet if you got 50,000 people to move to a small rural state with a low population density, you put them in every community and you made them promise to be politically active. You, you organized them. You united them, you put them all going in the same direction, you could effectively take over that state. In one of their footnotes, they listed a number of states that they felt were quote unquote ripe for a takeover, and Vermont was one of them. Um, other states, uh, Montana, you know, they didn't really notice, Vermont noticed. Someone put a copy of this article uh, on a, a senator named Arnold Tibbetts' desk, excuse me, a, a representative, State Representative Arnold Tibbetts' desk, and it arrived about the same time that Vermont was debating lowering the voting age to 18. Arnold Tibbetts represented Plainfield, Vermont, which included Goddard College. These two things fuse in his head and becomes convinced that if they lower the voting age to 18, 50,000 hippies are going to come, take over, and specifically vote him out. Uh, all, those plain, all those Goddard College students are going to vote him right out of the legislature. I did some research, that did not happen. He ends up getting reelected and then he retires um, from the legislature, but he panics about it. He panics about it in a committee meeting that gets reported in the Rutland Herald, that gets read statewide, that there is a file this thick in the Vermont State Archives of letters to Governor Dean Davis of people who read that letter, that article in the Rutland Herald, because it is now an established fact that 50,000 hippies are going to come to Vermont in the summer of, this is how rumors get started, in the summer of 1971. That gets picked up here in, uh, in Playboy magazine. Like that's how swiftly this rises to the national consciousness. Um, Vermont is not unique in its fears that people are going to come in and change the culture of the place forever. Other places around the country, um, the Southwest, California, um, some parts of the eastern seaboard, some places in Virginia and things like that, um, parts of Tennessee um, are also having large numbers of people move to get back to the land. But for our purposes, this is the, the bit about Vermont that's changed. What are people afraid of? I'm going to read this caption to you because it's amazing. This, this encapsulates all of the stereotypes that people are terrified are going to happen to the state of Vermont. I'll run over and pick up my unemployment check and then drop off at the university to see what's holding up my federal education check and look into my research grant check. You go to the free VD clinic and check on your tests, then go to the free health clinic and pick up my glasses. I'll pick up the food stamps, hit the drug rehab office, and we'll meet at the federal building at noon for the mass picketing of the stinking establishment. <laughs> this clipping was part of that folder that is now part of the Vermont State Archives that people sent to the governor of Vermont. That's where we found this. <laughs> this, this someone literally clipped this and said, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> they, were, they were not being satirical or ironic. They were serious. This, this is the image that people held. Um, that is obviously a, a stereotype. <laughs> So what's actually happening um, in Vermont at this time period? I'm going to run through a couple of groups of people focused primarily on communes, because that's, what, that's the sort of tip of the iceberg um, in the terms of what we're talking about. But it's important to remember that it's only a relatively small number of people um, who come to Vermont 
with the intention of being part of some kind of counterculture movement or going back to the land who end up living on communes. Remember that 44,000 people in the entire decade, 1970 to 1980? Seems a little more unrealistic that 50,000 people are going to come in one summer now. But of the people who came, some of them came to live on communes. Um, this is a community in Guilford, Vermont. Uh, a handful of communes had little to no organization. This is, this is one of them. Um, here are all the rules for this particular community. No illegal drugs, no more pets, no soap and stream, no picnickers, visitors welcome, no minors overnight without parents, and use the trench <laughs> for sanitary purposes. Um, some communities had a anyone can come, anyone can do anything they want, as long as they don't do it in the streets and scare the horses kind of philosophy. Um, their populations fluctuated a great deal, up to several hundred people in the summer, down to maybe a dozen people in the winter. There weren't too many, really many core members um, of that community. Some of these communities popped up for one summer and one fall and then disappeared. Some of them were advertised, and as far as we can tell, never started. Um, there was some research done in the 1990s that identified between 150 and 175 communities in Vermont in the decade of 1968 to about 1980. We've been able to definitively identify fewer than that that we think had some kind of substantive presence in Vermont, maybe about 100. That's not, that's not that many. But some had many hundreds of people. Um, one called Earth People's Park, particularly infamously, may have had as many as several thousand people uh, living on it. Earth People's Park was in the town of Norton, right up on the Canadian border of Vermont. And it was an outgrowth of a, of a California-based commune called the Hog Farm, um, which was the most notable person involved with that was Wavy Gravy. That's a name you remember. Earth People's Park took that free for everyone, do whatever you want, we're not going to make the rules, um, to an extreme. And frankly, to a, to a somewhat dangerous extreme. Um, there were basically no permanent structures. Uh, a lot of people arrived with the clothes on their backs, which did not always involve winter clothes. No food. Um, there was no running water uh, on the land. It was, it was a substantial piece of land. It was a couple hundred acres. Um, but it still was not great land. Um, and like I said, there were no rules. They held a handful of large gatherings, including concerts. Um, and the people of Norton had an extremely bad experience. Um, with the people who came up to spend time at Earth People's Park. Uh, some years later, the land was seized and given over to the town uh, on, because of some drug charges. This actually lasted into the 80s in some form or another. And the town turned it into um, something that they said could not include the words Earth People's or Park. So it's now something like a land sanctuary, I think they call it. Um, people made so many outgoing, call, outgoing calls that the, the downtown um, payphone was disabled, was taken out by the phone company. And this is a community where not a lot of people had phones in their homes at the time. It was a tiny, tiny farming community. When this was at its height, the people living on that land outnumbered the people in the town. So this is our, our sort of scariest, worst case scenario. We don't have... We do have some instances of, of actual violence and actual lawbreaking associated with this. Nothing really ever approached the sort of taking over everything, ruining everything fears that people may have had, but it certainly felt very real and very scary for some small communities. Um, this is, however, the exception um, to the rule. Most communities, and I'm going to use this example. This is from Earth People's Park. What are people looking to do when they come to Vermont to found uh, a collective community, a commune, a back-to-the-land farm? Call it what you will. I love this headline, Create America in Vermont. Why are people coming to Vermont? We don't have a good answer to that. But our best guess is that, as I said, that that land use shift is creating a lot of small farms up for sale. By Boston and New York prices, they look really cheap. It's not great land, but they don't know that. Um, and they're looking to go counterculture. They're looking to create a different way of life, a more wholesome way of life, a way that goes back, is more emotionally fulfilling, goes back to the way things should be. And there is a popular conception of Vermont as a sort of a pure place where democracy is, is truly reigns, where you can be yourself, um, where you can be rugged and by yourself, but there's also strong community ties. 
in short, it's, you know, we hear a lot today about the real America. It's a different conception of that real America. It's a different way of seeking it out and a different way of expressing it. So that create America in Vermont. Is there such a place as America, or are we living on an insane map held together by dreams and ideals that were perverted by their very creators? That sense of betrayal that's, that's coming out in large part of the protests uh, against Vietnam, that this isn't how it's supposed to be, let's go create the way it's supposed to be, is driving a lot of the creation of these communities. Um, the so I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the other communities. Free Vermont is a sort of larger movement coalescing uh, loosely, I mean really loosely, organizing and coalescing around a handful of communities. Free in two senses, free and we are free from previous restraints, free from previous societal restraints. Um, we don't necessarily have to hold to um, committed relationships. We don't have to raise our kids the same way they did. We don't have to eat the same foods, um, farm the same way, live the same way, but also in that things should be free, that there should be a shared sense of community. There's a free garage in Brattleboro. There's a free people's clinic, and it's, it's the start of the people's clinic in Burlington today, a sense that we have resources and gifts that we should share freely with other people. So it encompasses both of those ideas, um, but it also does have a, a more, mili some, pe some people take it to have a more militant aspect as well. This is a protest um, against the arrival of, this is Richard Nixon um, getting off the plane for a very brief, he literally got off the tarmac and got back on, Air Force One, um, campaign uh, stop in favor of, of one of Vermont senators um, at that time, but he was met with protesters and a, and a rally uh, at UVM. A partly organized by the Free Vermont. This is from a short, Free Vermont also had a short-lived newspaper um, that they connected people with. I think there were like six issues, so very short-lived. <laughs> um, but it's a way of organizing people. Um, so that is, there's, there's this big overriding philosophy, but I want to talk about some of our smaller communities um, and how they exemplify different aspects of this. This is a community called the Wooden Shoe. Um, wooden Shoe com Commune, community, what have you, is very small. This is basically all of them. Um, they lived on both sides of the Connecticut River, variously in Norwich, Vermont, um, or in a couple of different places in uh, New Hampshire. They were a sort of assorted group, mostly college educated. Uh, Jake Guest, where is he? There he is, Jake, um, was a Dartmouth graduate who had actually served in the Army um, during Vietnam, but actually got kicked out of Dartmouth a couple of times for taking over the administration building with a number of other students and then kept going back in. And very well educated, really smart guy. Um, today runs an organic farm in Norwich, Vermont. This community was really heavily focused on farming. Um, and Jake will tell you, after sitting through our Friday meetings, I can sit through anything. Every Friday they met for anywhere from four to six to eight hours, just, just them, <laughs> and discussed the way they wanted everything to go. They were going to share everything. They shared um, child rearing. This, this little boy was the only child um, born on the farm, but they shared child rearing with taking care of the animals, building the barn, um, keeping up the house. Men and women shared things equally. If there were any grievances or any, any problems, anything, they had to discuss it over in a group until everyone was satisfied and happy. They were looking to create a sort of consensual community, something with a far greater level of communication um, and, and involvement um, than had existed for any of them previously. This lasted not too, too long, um, maybe a little less than a decade, um, and eventually ended, everyone ended up going their own ways, but stayed, stayed close. Um, other members of that community, John Rosie, John Freitag, um, ends up becoming a excuse me, a woodcrafter, uh, and ends up using his, he's a conscientious objector during the Vietnam War, and he uses his um, required term of service to work for NOFA, which I will talk about in a little bit, as one of the early organizers for organic farming. Lisa, his wife, um, ends up becoming um, heavily involved in advocating for midwifery and for home births. Um, she's one of the first people uh, to insist on having her husband in the room while she gives birth to, to that that little boy there. Um, so they all go their own ways, but the, the things they learned on that community sort of travel with them, and that will be a theme. This is a photograph of um, a commune called Redbird uh, in Heinsberg, Vermont. This is a radical lesbian collective. There were actually um, deep and intense debates over like, at what age the, the boys who were born to the women should have to leave. Um, it, they were really set on, they decided they could stay as long as they want, <laughs> but it was more of a philosophical 
um, kind of sense. Um, this was actually formed uh, after uh, a group of women lawyers organized to financially and legally support two women who were being sued by one of the women's husbands to say that they were no longer, the woman was no longer a fit guardian for her children. Um, she was being sued to have her children taken away because she had come out um, as a lesbian. So they establish a, a legal defense fund and, and group of women that then goes national um, and becomes a, a strong organization. And then they um, move to this land near Heinsberg. They farm a little bit. Um, but primarily what they actually do is they all teach themselves trade skills, um, carpentry, uh, and all sorts of masonry, a variety of other um, skills, and they hire themselves out to earn land to live on this land during the summer. And then in Burlington, in, in a shared community in the winter, they also get very, very involved with um, support, supporting uh, victims of domestic violence uh, in Burlington, um, supporting shelters uh, for women and things like that. Uh, a number of them are still here in Vermont um, today. So this is one aspect of a com community that's very focused around particular political goals and political activism, and doesn't so much support themselves as they're a group of people who are living together to sort of find a new way to live and supporting themselves by, by working elsewhere and bringing the money back, um, which they share. It's a really interesting community, and they're all great people um, that I've met so far. This is a community called Mullen Hill. Um, there's actually a new book out about this if you want a really good read that's going to more eloquently and thoroughly tell you what I'm telling you tonight. Uh, Kate Delaz, who is not in this picture but was about that age <laughs> for Mullen Hill, um, wrote it about her parents and the community itself. Uh, it's called We Are As Gods. Highly recommend it. It's a great book. Um, but Mullen Hill had your, slight, your more traditional, um, they farmed. Some of them worked outside. Some of them kept the house. Um, they built a geodesic dome <laughs> over the course of one summer. People came. People went. There was a core group of people who stayed for a number of years. Um, this is up in the Northeast Kingdom. So this is a sort of more typical communal living. This is, this is Frog Run Farm in, uh, I, believe, I believe, in Charleston, Vermont. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting exactly where. Uh, Frog Run Farm uh, is, is a really pretty thoroughly agricultural community. They're really truly going back to the land. As you can see, they're, they're farming with horses. Um, we have some tons of phenomenal pictures of them farming and sugaring um, with their horses. Um, and they're all very, they were all very focused on, on the agricultural uh, aspect of going back to the land, which is a great way to seg into this gentleman here, um, whose name, unfortunately, we don't have. Um, one of the things we expected going into this project was that we would find a lot of tension um, between the people who are moving to Vermont and the people who are living here already. We didn't find a ton. There were certainly some, but the more common story we heard was, you know, we had been there for a couple of months and we were out there weeding our three acre carrot field by hand and the guy from down the road who had come up and watched us every day finally said, that is a terrible way to do that. An older retired farmer, maybe his kids had left and seek, seeking jobs uh, in Boston or New York and there was no one to take over his farm. The, a lot of the people who came up connected not with their parents' generation, but with their grand, grandparents' generation of Vermonters who were still um, on their farms, who knew all of these skills that these young people were trying to relearn, reinvent, reacquire by reading books and just trying it out. Um, they knew how to farm with horses. They knew how to um, tap sugar trees in an old way. They knew how to use uh, an older sawmill, um, use an old cider press that was done, that was powered entirely by horses or, or something like that. They knew how to farm organically because, you know, a lot of old farmers will say, that's just how we used to farm. <laughs> you know, we, we didn't use chemicals because they weren't available to us. So they had a really keen sense and a lifetime of understanding of this. And over and over and over again, we heard stories of, of people connecting um, with local people in their community. When we asked, um, and I so wish I could tell you who told, told us this, but one person we interviewed for the project when we said, why Vermont? They said, well, you went to California if you wanted to drop out, if you wanted nothing to do with anything anymore. You went to Vermont if you wanted to find community. 
that there was a sense that there was a deep embedded community here in Vermont that you could be part of and that you could create. And the most successful people, the people who didn't just come up for a summer and maybe half a winter and then go back to college or go to some other part of the country, the people who came, founded these communities or founded a small farm um, and stayed for years and years and years were the people who connected with, with people like this man um, and who wanted to be part of Vermont, part of their town um, and their community. And that's going to bring about what I will talk to you now, which is the longer um, lasting ramifications of this. Most of the movement of people coming to Vermont, um, and I should clarify briefly, 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 we're talking about mostly people under the age of 30, mostly people who have at least a college education, if not in some cases um, postgraduate or even doctorate degrees. And we're talking mostly about people who are middle class or even above that. Um, some of these people are, are buying lands with family money. Um, they're buying these farms with an inheritance or something like that. Some of them absolutely are, are scraping together the money themselves. But by and large, demographically, this is an affluent, young, and extremely well-educated uh, group of people, on average, who are coming to Vermont. So they are, they are well off. They have, now they have skills. Now they're part of their communities. And they have, as I mentioned, that background of political and social organizing. What are they going to do with it? This is a man named Robert Horier. Um, Robert Horier was uh, on Frog Run, helped found Frog Run Farm with his wife at the time. He, in 1970, he set off um, to travel the country and visit communes in an attempt to sort of try and understand um, the, the early parts of the countercultures called Getting Back Together. He published a book a year later. And by the end of the 1970s, he's um, in small scale local organic farming. He um, becomes one of the founders of, of NOFA, which at the time, was the Natural Organic Farmers Association. This is the first ever logo um, for NOFA, now the Northeast Organic Farmers Association. It's founded in Vermont, but now it is all of the New England states each have their own chapter. Um, and actually their archives are at UMass Amherst, uh, and their big conference is usually at UMass Amherst, but Vermont got there first. It was started in Vermont. And this is an early attempt to say, these people have started these small farms. They're farming organically. We need to support them by, fi by creating, finding or creating markets for organic produce, whether that is um, some people started trucking businesses to get produce down to Boston, uh, or founding um, food distribution groups, food buying groups, and food co-ops in Vermont. A lot of the earliest food co-ops in Vermont start around this time in the 1970s. This is an early, um, sort of a, or before they were storefront co-ops, they were buying groups. You would write down, I want 25 pounds of brown rice, 10 pounds of whole wheat flour, things you couldn't necessarily buy at a standard grocery chain in Vermont at the time. It would all arrive on a big truck. People would all pitch in. What they're doing here is they're pitching in and divvying it up. It's a little bit like the model of the CSA today, which is that you buy a whole chunk of something and, and it gets divvied up. But very quickly, um, they become storefronts. This is Plainfield Co-op, um, which is one of the earliest ones. Um, but a lot of them spring up within the same decade, right around that same time. Um, some of them spring up and have since, have since failed, but some of the biggest ones are still, still just like they were, only perhaps more commercialized um, than they were in the 1970s. So that sense of organization is going to start to, to fundamentally change the commercial nature. Um, of all of this agriculture. And it's these people who have done this experimenting with organic agriculture, who are now using their organizational skills, um, their, their commercial savvy, and their, their energy to create new, new ways of doing food systems. Um, some of the earliest people who um, worked on this went on to Washington to help write the national organic standards and to advocate nationally. Uh, another area in which these political organizing skills um, and this sense of back to the land um, organizing hits is uh, anti-nuclear protests. Um, by the time this really gets steam in Vermont, uh, Vermont Yankee is already up and running, although there were some early protests about Vermont Yankee. And so a lot of the focus um, of uh, Vermont, uh, of Vermont anti-nuclear 
um, protesting is going to be at the Seabrook um, power station in New Hampshire. This is a group of Middlebury College students. And I, the way they got there, I think, illustrates um, some of those ways. Early on, I showed you that um, poster of UVM students getting on buses to go down to Washington, D.C. These, um, these students were, uh, there was a local organizer who was not on campus at Middlebury College, was off campus in the town, who um, held classes in nonviolent resistance. Here's what happens if you get arrested. Here's what you should not, under any circumstances, do while you're getting arrested. Um, and then they, they organized to put them on buses and bring them to, to Seabrook to sort of gather up that enthusiasm and that desire to do something and channel it. Organize it, channel it effectively, and get it to where it could, it could do something. Um, so they, they took classes. One of the, I forget which one he is, I apologize, but the man who gave us this went to these classes as a, as a student at Middlebury and then went down to, to Seabrook. He was not arrested, uh, but certainly other Vermonters were um, at Seabrook. Uh, another way in which political organizing, I mentioned the Redbird Collective. This, might, this is one of my favorite photographs from the entire project, actually, um, was in the, the rise of advocacy for gay rights um, during the 1970s. And it's that, that strong, tight-knit gay community in Vermont combined again with that political activism and enthusiasm that's going to make Vermont the state that first state to pass civil unions and then the first state um, to pass gay marriage by, by legislative vote. A uh, man named Representative Bill Lippert um, moved to Vermont around this time in the 1970s um, and actually spoke uh, for us about a year and a half ago uh, about the political organizing of the 1970s. He's a, he's a textbook case of, so these people are getting involved in their communities. It's not long before you run for school board or you get involved um, with a local planning commission. Um, you know, the things that feel mundane, but when you're part of a community, you, you, you do that service, and then you build on it, and some of them are going to become politically active and interested enough to get elected to the legislature. And that's really where, where change occurs, um, is at these small local steps, local levels, and then all the way up to the state legislature. Uh, this is a gay person's guide to New England. It's modeled after the African American Green Book. It's a list of safe places, um, bookstores, restaurants, uh, hotels, um, where it's pretty explicitly for gay men, although it purports to be overall, but most of the sort of information is addressed towards gay men um, in here, uh, people to contact, um, places that are safe. Um, this is part of uh, the archives for a magazine called RFD, um, which is named a lot of different things, but it's a gay men's role living magazine. It's specifically for um, gay men on communes, and there's actually an issue that's edited entirely out of Vermont uh, in the 1970s. Another area in which people are organizing and, and starting to share information is in health education. This is a uh, handbook that was put together under the auspices of Free Vermont um, by people who wanted to just disseminate health information, basic things that it, people might not have known. Um, some of those communes, especially the ones without any rules, people were deeply concerned about sanitary measures. Um, and they wanted to fuse a sort of understanding of modern medicine with um, the beginnings of an understanding of an herbalism or a more uh, natural uh, homeopathic uh, remedies. So there's a sort of fusion of those two things uh, in, this, in this book. Uh, another way in which people actively organized um, is in uh, pro-choice movements with the passage of Roe v. Wade. This is actually a um, uh, associated Press photograph of a march for and against, both at the same time, which must have been interesting in Montpelier, uh, in 1979, on the sixth anniversary of Roe v. Wade, but a lot of um, women in particular were very active in, in advocating for and organizing in support of pro-choice um, and abortion rights in the 1970s. Um, this is another uh, example. Um, gentleman here is Don Mayer, uh, who is now the owner of Small Dog Electronics, got his start as a businessman. They would go out west and they would buy these old windmills. Um, and they would update them, retrofit them, and then sell them to Vermont farmers. The company he started is still um, in wind today, but this is representative of an overall push for alternative energy. It's not just wind, it's also solar. Um, wood stoves make a huge comeback in the 1970s. Vermont Castings, for example, is founded in the 1970s um, as a sense of renewable energy. It's all part and parcel of an overall push for environmentalism um, during the 1970s. And then our art. Uh, is also a big push in the 1970s. This is um, 
members of the Madbrook community, uh, which had sort of an interesting two-pronged approach. Um, they did not necessarily start off with a ton of money. They're not one of those people, communities, like I said, who bought their, bought their land outright. What they did was they organized very specifically and explicitly. They had two ways going. There were a group of them who were choreographers and dancers who would spend their time at the community um, practicing developing uh, new dance, uh, having it function sort of as a retreat and a creative, um, creative incubator, as you were. Um, and then they would go down, um, Steve Paxton and Deborah Hay are two of the names there, they would go down to New York City and um, perform um, or, or have their, have their dances performed. Uh, and then they were also leather workers. Um, the other part of the community were leather workers. Um, they did not have a huge agricultural presence. We, they, they very graciously gave us about six hours of time with about 40 people in a room, and none of them could quite remember if they'd had a garden. Um, I think they sort of indicated, yeah, there was one from a time to time, but that's just not, that's not how we were structured. Um, they had a storefront in Hartford, Connecticut, where you could go for a month or two at a time to sell these bags um, and these leather materials and then rotate back. Um, to the community to build it. And that's how they paid their mortgage, the income from the artistic, um, the dancing, and from the leather working. Uh, they were really an artistic community. And they are still actually, um, they, all, some of them still live on shared land um, in that in that space in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, this is one of their bags. Uh, part of our goal with this project was to collect people's memories, um, people's thoughts, and, and things like that, but also to collect objects. Uh, to add to the Vermont Historical Society collections. Um, and they were very graciously donated one of their bags um, to the collections. The last bit I want to talk about, um, a group of people got very involved in the Washington Electric Co-op, which it's one of those things on the surface sounds really boring. Why would a bunch of ex-hippies, or perhaps still hippies at that point, um, want to get involved in the, in the board of directors for a, an electric cooperative? But it's, it's actually really crucially important. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of public service that is going to affect the day-to-day -day life of a lot of people uh, in their community. And specifically, the people who did this were interested in making it more transparent, transparent um, interested in, in keeping prices fair for everyone, and interested in having it be much more of a shared community co-op rather than just a utility company, um, which was how it, had, how it had been started, and they wanted to bring it back to that. Um, social ecology studies at Goddard starts around this time. This was for the first program, and this is going to sort of take all these ideas and encapsulate it. Um, this is that Northwood campus where those, those students in that first slide uh, lived and where the social ecology program um, was based out of. There, that is still an, an active program at Goddard College. And this is our research center in Barrie. Um, what we did with all of this is we created an archive at the Vermont Historical Society. So the oral histories we collected, the objects we collected, these photographs, the posters, and everything like that will live in our care in perpetuity. And we created um, an exhibit that was on the front lawn advertising it for a little while. And there's the inside of the exhibit. If you find yourself in Barrie, it's open through the end of December. It will close on December 29th. And you can come up and see it until then. And see, so there's a Madbrook um, jacket that they made, among other things. And I'm going to close tonight <laughs> with a little bit of a fake out. Um, we started this project right around the same time Senator Sanders announced he was running for president. And we were like the hot call for every political reporter <laughs> who had never heard of Bernie Sanders. <laughs> um, because our press release went out, and then not long after, um, his, his publicity went out, and people thought that we could tell them all the answers. And at that point, we really couldn't, uh, frankly. And, and he's not exactly secretive. Um, so <laughs> we were not the best people to be calling anyway. But a lot of people see um, Senator Bernie Sanders as sort of the epitome of this counterculture in Vermont in the 1970s. Um, through the course of this project, he, he is certainly a highly representative example of a lot of those ideals and a lot of those activities. Um, but he actually came to Vermont in the 60s. He didn't do a whole lot in the 70s. He became mayor of Burlington in the 1980s. He was running for office in the 1970s, but not very successfully. He was part of the Liberty Union Party at that point, the third party that was founded it's an alternative party. Um, the, Jackie, who's our curator, argues, um, I think, 
successfully that a much more representational sample of what Vermont was like in the 1970s is Bread and Puppet Theater. This is a photograph of one of their earliest performances at Kate Farm, which was at the time part of Goddard College. They were invited to Goddard to be visiting artists um, at Goddard College. For those of you not familiar, Bread and Puppet is a sort of social protest puppet theater run by Peter and Elka Schumann. Um, they do this extraordinary art with a strong political and social message. They were active in New York City before coming to Vermont, and they still tour internationally um, with their, their theater troupe, and they are based now out of Glover, Vermont. They are, they are saying the exact same things, they are making the, the same art um, as they were in the 1970s.